I am so excited, especially I love seeing you, Alyssa, get this excited. We're speaking to a physician turned entrepreneur, similar to you, who has literally said, this system doesn't work. The system of treating women, especially women in perimenopause and, and menopause doesn't work and I'm gonna fix it. So we're talking to Somi Javed of her MD, and she literally is a force of nature. Absolutely. And this is somebody who comes with the background that is needed to actually start centers to take care of women's health on so many fronts because she's been on the front lines. So I think that's uh, very, very important, especially these days when it's big business and corporations that are, you know, trying to uh, navigate patient care. And they frankly haven't had that type of maybe personal experience. What I also love is instead of it being gloom and doom, the sky is falling, she and her team at her MD have such a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed outlook and the energy and the response from patients is palpable. And she literally is working incredibly hard, but has this, you know, unbelievable enthusiasm. And the other thing, you've done this too. I'd love to hear your perspective. She's also trying to eliminate calls. She's a mom. She has three kids. A lot of her executive team are also working parents, but she really is so sensitive to what it's like to be a female physician, especially an obstetrician, which you practiced for a long time, as did she, and the demands that it makes on your life and how likely it is to lead to burnout. Well, I love the story also because, you know, we are seeing so many people retire, quit, take another type of position outside of medicine altogether through the last couple of years due to burnout. And instead of quitting, she has found a solution, which I think is going to be all that. So let's talk to Somi. Welcome to the Business of the V. Hello, friends and colleagues. I'm Dr. Alyssa Dweck. And I'm Rachel Braunschirl. Each week, we bring you the most fascinating investors, inventors, entrepreneurs, academics, and healthcare practitioners who are making things happen in women's sexual and reproductive health. If you are a woman, know a woman, have a business or care about your V health and wellness, fasten your seatbelts and listen in to another informative and inspiring episode. We are so excited to welcome our guest tonight, Dr. Somi Javed, who is the founder and CEO of HerMD. She has many, many accolades, brilliant physician, winner of all kinds of awards, but has now decided to focus her prodigious talent um, on really a business opportunity that takes advantage of her huge experience. Welcome, Somi. How are you? I'm great. I'm so excited. Thank you for having me. Well, we are so excited and I always love it, particularly when I've had a chance to know the people that we're speaking to and, you know, know a little bit about their story. And one of the things I know we'll love is putting you and Alyssa together as, you know, physicians who have so much in common and have both used those skills after being successful clinicians to also start your own businesses. But we're going to turn it over to you. So you were a, a award-winning practicing ob -GYN. you have many ex areas of expertise in menopause, sexual medicine, intimacy. Um, tell us how you got from there to the creation of what is going to be a, a medical empire, her MD. Thank you for that. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it is a very personal story. I knew that I wanted to go into women's health care because I nearly lost my mother when she was only 45 years old. Uh, I was pre-med at the time. And, you know, she presented with left arm pain, uh, shortness of breath and chest pain. And if you Google that now, even if you're not a physician, you would be like, uh, it's her heart. Uh, she had EKG changes and science and data at the time couldn't explain why a 45 year old thin non-smoking woman would ever present with four vessel disease. Uh, luckily for us and for her, she finally got a diagnosis. Uh, although it required emergent quadruple bypass surgery and is alive to this day. But that was my aha moment that women needed advocates and I was going to make a difference. So fast forward, right? Through residency and medical school. And my first job um, smacked me in my idealistic face. I was seeing 50 patients a day in a private practice setting where we take insurance. And I didn't have time to go to the bathroom or eat lunch let alone advocate 
for my patients or make change. And so when the timing was right, both personally and professionally, I am a working mom. Um, I opened the doors to the first HerMD Center in Cincinnati, Ohio in 2015, and uh, quickly noticed that women from 35 states and three countries were coming to uh, Ohio. <laughs> so we knew we were on to something. Yeah. So talk about that. I mean, those numbers are astounding. And I know as you've opened each new facility, the wait lists are thousands of people and six months and from all over the world. Um, and you, if, I wish you could you could see both these physicians' faces like nodding. And I love that your story had a personal um, catalyst, but a happier ending than so many of the stories that we hear. So what was it that you did that was so different? And now I think you're about to open your fifth clinic. Talk about the model. And then I'd love Alyssa to chime in and talk about how she's seen some of these changes affect her practice as well. So, you know, I was caught in this system um, that was broken, both from a patient perspective and a provider perspective, right? You're not seeing any type of significant change. And for me, the biggest thing was how was I going to give women the time and space that they deserved to discuss these very, very personal issues? And so many people told me, you're never going to be able to do it. Why bother? People said, your husband makes enough money. Like, why are you trying to do this? Just stay home. Um, oh. You're never going to be able to change the system. And I took my idea to multiple hospital systems and got patted on the head, you know, like basically little girl, go, go away. Like, you're never going to be able to do this. And so uh, what I had to figure out is how do I make longer appointment times uh, last in an insurance-based system. That was very important to me is providing menopause and sexual health care um, to my patients within an insurance-based system. And I had to think about revenue streams. So I brought in a surgical center. I brought in ultrasound. I brought in lab. I brought in a medical spa. And people thought that was crazy. But I knew that I didn't want to go membership. I didn't want to go concierge like a lot of my colleagues had done. And I know and I respect that because insurance companies, frankly, the dollars and cents don't make sense. It's not going to work. You can't see a patient for 60 minutes and not have any other revenue streams. But for me, it was so important to offer this type of health care. And so we offer... Um, you know, fillers and Botox and cool sculpting and laser hair removal. And as an OBGYN, I was talking to patients about all of these symptoms anyway. So if you have a woman who has polycystic ovary syndrome, you know, they have hirsutism, which is excess hair growth. They have acne, they have abnormal bleeding, they have infertility. And so we're able to take care of their nutrition needs, their ultrasound, their contraception or their fertility. But then also, you know, they're like, I don't like having this goatee. Like I want to do something about it. And so that is what I love. And our postmenopausal patients, you know, they like to come in for their annuals and talk about sexual health. And they'll say, I'm going to come in for my PAP, my hormones and my Botox. And they love it because they have a deep connection with their providers. And that really allows the care continuum. But the amazing thing about it is that spa not only unlocks all of these procedures that women are seeking, but truly supports the gynecologic side of the practice and allows our providers to see 40 to 60, you know, see patients for 40 to 60 minutes. And that was the other problem we solved. Give providers mission-driven work, allow them to see 15 patients a day max, and allow them to truly practice medicine in the way it was intended. Um, we have almost zero provider turnover at HerMD. And so that's what I love is that we looked at both sides of the equation and really tried to solve for that. Okay. So first of all, I'm falling off my chair because I have PTSD from seeing 35 to 50 people a day and have recently stopped the madness. But I have to really ask, how is this possibly realistic in a insurance-based uh, practice? So the way I'm envisioning this, and please correct me if I'm um, envisioning it wrong, is that there's like a, a traditional medical side with, uh, you know, uh, evidence-based medicine care and wonderful providers where we're doing traditional things. And I have a couple of questions about that. And then there's the other side, which is more, you know, almost what we call the aesthetic side, which probably doesn't really take insurance as it's uh, feeding. So is, is that the way it works where that side feeds the other? 
Absolutely. And they both feed each other. And you are right. On the medical side, you have providers and researchers and clinicians. We're doing clinical research trials that we're presenting at ASCO and NAMS and ISHWISH. And so we're very, very data-driven. We have digital algorithms of care that not have not only been singly peer-reviewed, but doubly peer-reviewed um, by outstanding providers in the um, sexual health environment. So we've got this, but then we have a separate set of providers that provide those aesthetic-based services. I did not want any confusion from patients. I think it's very off-putting if someone does your pap smear and then grabs you by the hand and says, come on, let me go inject your face. Um, and so the providers are separate and distinct, but cross-trained. For example, if a woman comes over to the medical spa and wants dermaplaning, you know, where you use a scalpel um, to remove excess hair, um, our providers have been trained that if it's not a typical amount uh, for a patient, they will say, hey, have you ever been worked up for hormonal abnormalities? Is there something else going on? Same with if they have crazy amounts of acne. Have you been to the dermatologist? What have you tried? You know, what medications are you on? And, you know, same with the medical providers. They are able to offer patients laser hair removal or acne peels. And so that is the really nice thing. And because we're not dependent upon a singular revenue stream, there is no hard selling in the offices. This is a very, I think that's what people have a really hard time wrapping um, their heads around is that it's a very, very natural transition. The offices are beautiful. The spa is laid out right next to the medical offices and frankly, the JCO accredited surgical suite. And so we're doing ablations and sonata procedures in the office. And like you said, bread and butter, gynecologic care. Um, but then, yes, we also have a med spa. But that was my workaround to not go concierge and not go a membership model, which a lot of my competitors have done. And so it's been fantastic. It's a win-win. Amazing. Um, so I'm just curious about, curious about a couple of nuts and bolts. So on the medical side, what happens when someone needs like major surgery? Are they just affiliated with a hospital and take care of that outside of your uh, four walls? Who who covers call at night for emergencies? Like, how does it work where you just really seem to have the best of both worlds, but all the difficult things that I know I've been through and I'm sure you've been through? I'm, I'm just wondering, where is that taken care of? So a lot of our providers do perform hysterectomies and take care of patients in the hospital. They want to do that. And so that's what's really nice is that we're able to maximize the amount of care that you are afforded within the HerMD umbrella. Um, and as far as care uh, or a call, it's so funny um, that you asked that because one of my major initiatives was how do I improve work-life balance even more? You and I both know this as physicians, the number one reason for medical errors is not lack of knowledge. It's actually burnout when patients or providers are exhausted and you're making decisions. And so I wanted to eradicate call and we are about out to eradicate call for all of our providers um, with a two-step approach. So we are um, giving call to a company called Zipnosis that will take care of calling in an antibiotic if you have a vaginitis or you're in a tract infection. And then the really nice thing about Zipnosis is, is let's say you're very nervous and you're scared and you still want um, to access an MD, they are able to do that for our patients, which we typically have not been able to do after hours because you can imagine I can't staff that yet. We're not quite there yet. Um, and then we also have a doc in the box system where we have um, partners who are willing to help her MD um, take call because, you know, we hand off all of our obstetrics patients because we do not do OB past the first trimester. And so it's this mutually beneficial relationship, not only for the providers, hey, I get this, you get this, but also for the patient, right? These are our trusted partners that will take care of you. And um, so that is how we have been able to take care of patients um, during office hours and then afterwards. How come nobody thought about this beforehand? I mean, I'm in a massive practice. There is no such thing as zipnosis, but believe me, I've written that down <laughs> um, because call really does burn people out. So, um, and I love that it's sort of like a one-stop shop for every type of uh, procedure um, that people have to typically be farmed out for to another specialist. So that's amazing. 
I think the reason is you and I know that both know this, that most physicians are not the decision makers when it comes to hospital systems, when it comes to healthcare systems, right? We're just seen as providers or a cog in the wheel. We don't matter. Um, And so I think for me, the one amazing thing is, you know, we're venture backed, meaning we've been invested in um, and our, one of our founders is a physician. And so he gets it. And then we are led by an executive team, but it's very rare. You know this, you're in business <laughs> on the exact team or for people to even um, pay attention to that. And so when I am a great storyteller, right? Most of us who go into business, you are. And so I paint the picture of what it's like to be on call, right? And they're like, oh, it's no big deal. You know, you guys aren't doing deliveries, blah, blah, blah. And once I said, you can't be more than 30 minutes away. You can't go to your child's game two hours away. You can't drink because God forbid if you get called in. So I said, yes, we did this study and saw that very few calls were coming in because we educate our patients so well. We give them uh, great data on what to do in, in case of emergency Um, And they were like, listen, only X amount of calls are coming in. I said, but you understand your life stops when you are on call. And that's all it took for me to tell the story of what it's like and what it does to providers after hours. And it was like light bulbs went on. And I think no one has ever told them in a way in which they understand what is it like when you're actually on call beyond the data. What I love in all of this, and besides that, the model is so brilliant. I mean, I've worked with lots of businesses where the um, person buying the services or the products were obstetricians and gynecologists. And always what we would hear back is, well, we don't want to do these aesthetic procedures because it's not science, or we don't want to find these, you know, different sources of revenue that are too commercial. And you've basically said, okay, I get it. I'm going to make them connected. (laughs) <laughs> but not overlapping. And I remember telling Alyssa, I've been on the phone with my own gynecology practice where you hear the advertisement when you're on hold to make an appointment that they want to do hair removal. But it sounds like the person that went to medical school is the same person who's doing your hair removal when it probably shouldn't be. So in addition to having the insurance piece, which as we know, uh, doesn't come close to covering all the costs. You have the aesthetic piece and you also have an, an addition that many other practices don't have and businesses don't have, which is the, the products that you have in the office and that you will in the future have um, on an e-commerce website. How does that fit in to your business model? So for me, I think the biggest um you know, problem that I wanted to solve is I love prescribing HRT. I love doing surgery. I love fixing a problem. I'm evidence-based, but there are so many patients who are like, listen, I don't want HRT or I don't want this procedure, but I'm willing to try a product. Right. And then they're bringing me bags of the products that they're buying over the counter, like happy hoo-ha cream. And I'm that doesn't work. I'm not, I'm sorry, whoever made it, I'm not an endorser of your branding or your ingredients, but um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I always have to, I always get myself in trouble, but you know, it, and it's like coming from a place of, I have to protect you from this. And then really looking and seeing that there are no physician curated um, products out there or sites out there that can really get to the patient. And so for me, I had no interest in developing or didn't have time on developing my own product line, like for her MD, but I was like, let me highlight the people like you, Alyssa, who have done this and had made this their life's work. And so let me take the best of the best and then add this as a risk benefit alternative when we're talking to the patient, depending on whatever chief complaint they're coming in with. And we all know this in sexual health care, there are no, there are no FDA approved options for orgasm dysfunction or arousal disorder, and just a handful of options for sexual pain. And so for me, I wanted to bring in quality based products that were evidence based, especially for those women who weren't candidates for HRT, or who frankly weren't ready for or tell, told me that they didn't feel comfortable. Even though I broke down the data for them, they were too scared. And they were like, hey, listen, we're ready for this. So then the product they tried, I wanted them to have success with. Because the other uh, thing that really upset me 
is women are already, I feel like invisible patients. They get dismissed. We face delays in diagnosis. We wait longer than men for our pain medications in the ER. We're more likely to die of cardiovascular disease or heart attacks like my mother. And so for me, I heard the stories of women who felt like they were broken because they finally spent 30 to $50 on a product that made all these careless claims. Um, and then it was worse. And I wanted to make sure that I curated products for them that I knew worked, that were safe, that the branding and marketing, like the patients saw themselves in it, right? And it wasn't like a shriveled, dried piece of fruit that I remember going one time going, what is this? Um, and so that was very important to me. And so that's why it is so important for us to bring in um, products for our patients. Here's today's hot flash. What are care deserts? Care deserts are areas where people do not have nearby access to health care. The March of Dimes reports that more than 2.2 million women of childbearing age live in maternity care deserts that have no hospital offering obstetrical care, no birth center, and no obstetric provider. Amazing. Plus, there's the convenience factor, but there's also the embarrassment factor. A lot of people do not want to receive boxes in the mail that may have some, uh, you know, uh, uh, shameful uh, labels, if you will. Um, I have a couple of questions. I mean, I think your model is amazing and that this is just dedicated to women only, which I think is, uh, or people who are identifying as women, yeah. I should say. How are you going to compete and how do you currently compete with the big guys, the really big guys, the United Healthcare's, the now uh, Oak Streets, the, you know, the, the really big guys who get such great deals with insurance or whatnot? What is the uh, what is the plan there? What's the play there? Oh, yeah. We, well, I have uh, prepared value based care models and value props. And I ask for meetings with the chief medical officers. And, you know, there's some markets we go into and they say, oh, we have enough GYNs in Tennessee. We're not even going to contract with you. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. You know, and I kill them with data. There are three ish trained um, GYNs in your entire state, one of which is in Nashville. You're telling me that um, your Patrons don't need our care or our services. I have been known to go on social media and encourage um, insurance companies to please play nice with her MD. Um, so I, I've got lots of bags of trick, but uh, tricks. But the bottom line is, you know, just killing them with that internal data that we have. For example, we just did, uh, we pulled an internal study on IUD complication rates at her MD with the way that we uh, insert her MD the way we insert IUDs at HerMD. The national complication rate for IUDs is roughly up to 10%. At HerMD, it's less than 1%, just with the small things that we do. And so we're pulling all of this internal data now and really showing this to our um, you know, partners are the insurance-based companies. And as far as the competitors, I, you know, it's so funny. I go into these because we're raising again. You know, we successfully raised, we closed another tranche, we're raising again. And so I don't feel like we have any true competition right now. There are a lot of other national women's healthcare brands that are popping up. A lot of them are focused on fertility or obstetrics or are cash um, based or are membership model based. None of them are doing clinical research trials. If you really look at what they're offering, they'll say they're doing menopause, but really they just do the consult and then they refer off and they don't prescribe. And so for me right now, I'm lucky her MD is a blue ocean opportunity and that we are truly the only, what I say, integrated both brick and, brick and mortar and virtual yeah. within an insurance-based system where we're offering menopause and sexual health care. And a hundred percent of our providers are trained in both. Like a hundred percent of our providers are Ishwish NAMS graduates. They go through her MD university. They're trained uh, by the big wigs. Uh, we have those algorithms of care that I talked about. So the training, there's no competition right now as to a her MD provider and, and what else is out there. Love when you that. talk about product market fit, you know, often you say the market will tell you. Uh, mm -hmm. You talked a little bit about your first location, um, 30, people from 35 states and three countries. Share a little bit more about the spectacular response you've gotten. You're in you're in Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana, Indiana. and soon to be New Jersey. And you've, it sounds like you've had the same dramatic 
you know, it's like you're a Broadway hit wherever you go. Talk a little bit about those numbers and some of the responses you're getting from patients. I mean, to me, it's uh, unbelievable. I knew it was going to happen because I saw it in Ohio and Kentucky. I mean, guys, we're not New York. We're not LA. We're not fun to visit. It's a great place to raise kids. But I mean, we knew we were onto something, uh, particularly my co-founders knew we were onto something when we had patients coming from all over the country, including a woman who drove two days to come see me because she had HSDD or hypoactive sexual desire disorder, had had a stroke and was told by other physicians um, just be thankful you're alive, like just live with it. And she was on the brink of losing her marriage. She was severely depressed. They were like, it's not going to kill you. Um, and you know, she drove two days to come see us because we took her military insurance and she found us on a discussion board. And so that's what was happening. Our patients were our biggest marketers. I mean, Rachel and Alyssa, we had no money for marketing. This is when we were bootstrapped. Okay. Um, and so every market we've gone into, we've seen wait lists uh, in the hundreds. Um, we are 20 minutes into our open houses and ribbon cuttings, and there are lines out the door. We get two to 300 women to show up. Um, and literally it is, thank you. Thank you for seeing us, for providing a space that we feel heard. And thank you for coming um, to our market. And so that's what's happening in all the states um, that we're going into. And it's it's really humbling, but it's also really, really exciting. How do you choose your locations? I mean, in my mind, because, you know, my life revolves around New York, of course, mm-hmm. um, the, the locations you've chosen are, you know, uh, very populous and whatnot, but they do seem a little random. Was there a method to <laughs> uh, the uh, location choice? Oh, that's not a question I don't get uh, like every day from investors. They're like, what, 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 what's your growth plan? What are you doing? So for me, you know, a girl from the Midwest um, and watching what happened to my mother, um, for me, it was tier two markets and, and what's defined as care deserts and women who really needed access to this type of care because it's not available to them. And so that was first and foremost. But we have a very elegant um, data collection system and algorithm on how we choose um, sites. It's based on population, how many rooftops are in that area, closeness to a major metropolitan tier two city. Um, We did a study on how far her MD patients were willing to drive, and it's much further than a typical GYN office. So we knew we could be 20 to 30 minutes outside of a city in these lifestyle um, areas, you know, where you'll see um, like yoga studios and the high-end grocery stores. And so that's where we like to be within a 20 to 30 minute uh, driving range of, of a city. And then we also look at things like where are the SEO searches going on for Addy or HSDD or sexual health and the needs are being unmet. And then we look at the Ishwish and NAMS providers and see how many are in that state, how many are actual gynecologists, right? Like we're going to be different than a urologist or an internal medicine doctor who's gone to those courses because they can't do ablations. They can't do an office ultrasound or surgery. And so there's definitely different offerings that we have. Um, we look at the med spas in the area for sure. Um, so it's a very, very elegant method of choosing the cities that we need to go into. And for those who ask me, like, what are you doing? I'm like, obviously we're choosing correctly because our two offices right now that we just opened um, in the first month, we hit six month forecast forecast appointment numbers. Um, And I'm already having to hire third and fourth providers at both of those locations um, because we cannot keep up with demand. Can I ask a little about telehealth? You know, we got swamped with telehealth during the pandemic. And now that we're, you know, emerging from that, it really seems to have slowed down quite a bit. Are you finding the same or are you finding since some of your locations are a little bit more, you know, uh, spread out, let's say, that uh, telehealth visits are still super popular, especially for follow-ups maybe? So telehealth for us is still super popular, but you're right. We changed our strategy. We learned from some of our um, competitors not to grow too quickly in the virtual space, and especially because there are so many people. And I do love that as an entrepreneur, and I want a lot of these companies to succeed. Um, but you know, there's always learnings, right? I, I, I say that I'm a forever student. And so what we're doing is wherever we are dropping a brick and mortar, we are picking up that state and the surrounding states because we 
people drive in, right? And they love having that brick and mortar place where if they are on HRT and they have bleeding, they can come get their ultrasound and biopsy if they need it, you know? And so they love having the chance and the ability to have that face-to-face, but they also love the convenience of online booking and virtual care. And so for us, you're exactly right. We will do a lot of our follow-ups via telehealth or even those first consults for, let's say, a woman who wants to decide whether or not she's going to drive in or fly in. Um, So we will capture a lot of those, but we changed our strategy to not expand to all. We were going to try to go all 50 states by 2024, and we're really going to grow our virtual step in step, hand in hand with our brick and mortar. So what I find fascinating, um, first of all, it's rare for me to meet a doctor who I'm so overwhelmed with and and wish that I could see her um, as a patient. I say that every time I'm on a conversation with Alyssa, like if people Mm -hmm. only could get to her, that was what they would want to do. But what strikes me is especially after the pandemic, there's so much burnout, there's so much dissatisfaction, but speaking to you about practicing medicine is like a, a literal breath of fresh air. Like you, you, I mean, your enthusiasm and the joy and the success you're having, you know, is really contagious. So that's one of the things that so stands out every time I see you, or I get to see other folks on your team is really positive. You're sort of bucking the trend and creating something that actually is very capital intensive to put up these facilities all over the, all over the country and you're killing it. And it's just amazing to watch. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's truly because one of the first things that was most important to me is writing down the mission statement and what was so important to us and that we would not become a toxic medical environment. If you don't take care of your providers and your people, then you can't take care of patients, right? You can't if you're burned out yourself. And there are rough days. The entrepreneur ride is oh, for sure. Like we this. all know. But I always have another her MD co-founder or provider, you know, for a hug or a high five. But Rachel and Alyssa, you know what keeps me going are every single day, the social media shout outs or the reviews we're getting for patients who are just like, you know, our first day in Indiana, there was so much stuff going on behind the scenes. You know, anytime you open a new clinic, it was like, this wasn't right. And this wasn't right. And And just be clear, it wasn't in Indianapolis. It was in Carmel. Yeah. Yes. North. Carmel, Indiana. Yes. And so literally, you know, we have 200 women go through by 618, the entire 4,000 square feet is filled. And then the the next day was the first day. And I was there, you know, hands on because I like, you know, being there for the providers. And it was a little chaotic, you know, like organized chaos, but it was chaotic. And everyone was like, oh my God, we have to do this and this and this. And then literally at the end of the day, we hadn't even had reviews open yet, but this woman took the time to find an ad. And underneath the ad, she puts, in 49 years, I have never been listened to like I was at my first encounter at her MD. Like, thank you for coming to Carmel. And we were like, I I screenshotted it. I sent it to my entire team. And I said, you guys, this is why we do what we do. And everyone was like, high five, high five, high five. It's so funny. Like the kitchen is chaotic, but then everyone thinks "It's, it's great. And patients are thankful and grateful. And they are the fuel um, that keeps us going. And for me, nearly losing my mother when I didn't have to, like when the surgeon came out, you guys, he said to me, she had a 95% occlusion of her LAD and she would not have survived if the heart attack would have come. And to me, I remember being in those rooms with her and her pleading for, for her physicians to listen to her and they wouldn't. And I was like, no. And so for me, That's what drives me, that women aren't invisible patients, that they're heard, that they're partners in their care, but they also are not exposed to opportunistic um, individuals. And you know this, a lot of people are jumping on the menopause and sexual health care game. And that's why the clinical trials and the evidence-based medicine and the teaching is so important to me um, and truly sets us apart. So that's what keeps me going. (laughs) I love this. You are truly, as Rachel says, a breath of fresh air. I have to ask one final question that actually is very personal to me, but do you ever miss clinical medicine? I mean, I know it's only been a couple of months, but you know, after all the training we go through and all the difference you've probably knowingly made in all these patients' lives, do you miss that? I mean, you're on a major mission, which is super important, but I wonder about that. 
I do. And I talk to so many physicians about their second act and that's what they're so worried about. And for me, you know, I live in uh, Cincinnati where two of the clinic clinics are very close to, and I run into patients all the time, whether I'm shopping or out with my kids and they're all, they were angry. You guys, when I left, I was practicing for 20 years. I had a giant book of business and they all we probably lost less than 1% of our patients. They stayed with her MD. They were very loyal. And my providers are absolutely amazing. Um, I don't want to say they're extensions of me. They are amazing providers in their own right. But yes, I do miss it. When I see them, I miss them. I miss their stories. I miss that interaction with them. I miss making that fantastic difference in the room. But what I concentrate on is I made differences every single day in those rooms, but I'm just now focused on, okay, by opening all these clinics, think about all of the women that we're going to treat. And we're also breaking that status quo right now that less than 20% of OBGYNs are trained in menopause and sexual health care. Like we're, we're fixing that. And so to me, I'm focused on those goals, but yes, I miss them. Um, I'm lucky I live where two of the clinics are, so I get to see them, but I miss them. Honestly, I could, we could speak. I let, well, we then. could go. We we like these to be bite sized so that people we keep everyone's attention. But what you're doing is amazing, and it is so exciting to see you saying the system is broken. There's a way to do it better, and it's working. It's not just working philosophically. You're getting investment. You're getting attention. You're driving revenue, and you're changing lives. So, on behalf of Business of the V, keep up the good work, and we will literally watch your every move Absolutely. and be cheering you on. We are watching and cheering you on. Thank you. Don't forget, subscribe to our podcast at businessofthev.com for the latest trends and trendsetters in women's health and business.